machine shop Tapping threads and turning metals non-stop Every day, a challenge we face With our taps and patience We ace this race Greasy hands, the sparks flying high the Machines hum every dice Small shop, big dreams, we're on our way With taps and patience, we'll seize the day we have theme music. <laughs> oh my god. I think goodness. Harrison just about died, but we have theme music now. <laughs> <laughs> Is that the thing you sent me the other day that I did forgot to listen to? Yes, this was a different one. But oh. yeah, so it turns out AI music has gotten really good. Oh my goodness. That is hilarious. And the theme of this podcast apparently is we use AI tools for everything. So <laughs> well, you do. I don't use them enough, apparently. <laughs> I yeah. The prompt from that was like, write theme music for a podcast called Taps and Taps and Patience. The music should be eighty style. The podcast is about the day to day struggles and challenges of running the machine shop. That is it. That is all I did. Oh man, that's good. That was really good for for that. That's I know impressive. it's in. Yeah, I don't know. So how you doing? You know, I am good. I'm I'm tired. Um, maybe getting a little bit sick. I can't quite tell Uh-oh. yet. Um, but other than that, doing well. So I'm feeling a little bit more caught up and on top of things than last week. Last week was a slog. This week or over the I guess it was the week before and then last week, whatever. Uh, I'm doing better now. It's the moral of the story. I did have a project where I broke like a whole bunch of one sixteenth inch end mills for various mm-hmm. dumb reasons, which actually kind of got me a enforced vacation or not vacation, but an enforced weekend because the parts I was running were uh, super glue work holding. And I broke my last one sixteenth inch end mill and I didn't have a reference feature that I could take the parts off the machine and put them back on again. And so they just stayed on the machine. And I did things other than machining over the weekend. Well, I guess kind of nice to give you a little bit of a break. Yeah, it wasn't bad. And I'm not feeling rushed by any deadlines at the moment. So it's fine. It's always a great feeling. Weston's going to be gone all next week. And ironically, so is my wife. So I'm going to be alone on two fronts. And it's we'll see how it goes. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So... Order a shop pizza and, and find a good audiobook. I, I guess I'll have to shop in the house to myself, so we'll see how it goes. But uh, other than that, I mean, our machine last week was just running nonstop on that big job, and it finished up over the weekend. And now I'm just kind of... It, it's nice because I don't have any pressing jobs except for one zometry job that's due on Wednesday. Okay. So material was supposed to come in today and it didn't. So we're a little mm. bit nervous. Yeah. Cause it was supposed to come in today. So we're going to figure out what's going on with that tomorrow. It's a big part. It's the biggest zometry part or probably the biggest plate job we've ever done. It's going to be almost 17 inches square. Okay. That's sizable and about a half inch thick. So it's going to be a pretty big plate. Um, And we're going to give it a shot. (laughs) So we'll see how it goes. So don't really want to scrap that. Yeah, I've just got stuff on my plate for design the everything. The the thing I kept breaking tools on was the orange slices, the little keychain things. Mm -hmm. And. I broke so. I had a limited number of one sixteenth inch end mills. I think I had two and I broke the first one just because I had my speeds and feeds wrong. And then I broke the second one because I like screwed up the order of some tool paths when I was trying to restart it after the broken one. Mm. And so it did the classic finishing before roughing. Yep. And and, and then I got to wait for three days for new end mills to come in. I I ran a part today that really scared me, but worked out much better than I thought it would. And it's Five not axis? 
No. I mean, yeah, there was some five axis in it, but the reason it was scary was just because it was the deepest continuous cut and it was a long and thin part. And I didn't mm. have to machine it this way. It's probably not the ideal way to machine it, but it made it two ops instead of four. And so I did that <laughs> and it worked. Yes. So basically, mm. if you go look on my Instagram, I think we took a video of it. It was a part that was about two and a half inches tall and it had drilled and tapped holes on either end. And ra- and it and one of the ends was tapered, and so that part I actually did in the in the five axis, but the op one I had it sticking out of the part or out of the vice about two and a half inches, and I had a two and a half inch end mill that came in and did the whole outer profile, and it left about ten thou off the bottom off the top of my vice, mm. and so it was really close to the vice. It was really long stick out, and it was just a very scary cut for me for like the first time I ran it. Cause I was like, in theory, this should work. Um, <laughs> but let's, let's find out. Is this and the one up- that has like two angled sections and two flat sections from three uh, weeks ago? No, no, no. This is a new part. Or this is a relatively new part to us. It's it, all it is. is a block with holes, but okay. a, imagine a rectangle with two opposed with holes on uh, with with two holes and then two holes except one of those faces has an angle to it. And so I didn't want it what I, the way I would have done it in the past is I would have taken a block laid it on its side done the whole outer profile including the angle and then mm-hmm. tipped it up and drilled and tapped the two holes on one side and then I'd have to tilt it at an angle to drill and tap the other two holes. Um the way I did it this time was I just took a block and I stood it up and I did the whole outer profile long ways and then drilled and tapped the holes on one side, flipped it over and stuck it in the five axis, took the hat off, probed it, and then did the angle cut and drilled and tapped. Okay. And so it ended up saving a whole lot of time doing it that way. It was just the scary fact of, of long reach tool with tall part that was thin because it was only... It was, like I said, two and a half inches tall, and it was, I think, a half inch thick when it was all said and done. And so it was just like this thing could turn into a harmonic fork and or a tuning fork and just vibrate to pieces and destroy my tooling. And like I, I saw bad things happening, and I was just like, eh, we'll try it. A harmonic fork is the most scientific way I've ever heard a tuning fork referred to. It sounds like yes. something that should be in a sci-fi book. Yeah, well... I couldn't think of tuning fork for so yeah. har- so. It's so I default to the harder. I, I default to the more complicated description. Anyways, so that was a uh, that was a uh, fun. And then I we took a video of it because it, it's we're using a core five uh, kind of metal five flute uh, rougher mm-hmm. for it, and it was throwing chips like crazy. And so I think Weston took a video of it looking at the side glass and it's just showering it with chips. Yeah. I think that's what's on Instagram. Yeah. And so it was just kind of crazy seeing that much material come off that fast. I think looking at the MRR calculation, it was something like 50 cubic inches a minute in aluminum. Nice. Yeah. So it was pretty wild. I don't get that in my machine. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was only, I think like 20 or 30% spindle load. So it was pretty cool. I have a fun part coming up that I'm excited to do. It's a fairly high volume job for me. It's a hundred mm-hmm. pieces, which I don't know if I've done a hundred pieces before other than like carabiners and stuff, but it's, it's a part that you've seen a variation of a hundred times. It's basically like a diamond base with two holes, one on each side. And then in the middle, in the middle, there's a cylinder sticking up. Mm-hmm. It kind of looks like something you would put a flag in or something, except it's this one's a fairly small being about an inch across the, the diamond. But I'm excited for how I'm going to do this one. I'm going to do it in one op and salami slice it, except the it has countersink sunk holes on the, the bottom. So if the cylinder is sticking up on one side, on that side, if you're looking down at the top of the cylinder, it's just a hole. But if you turn it over and you look at what would traditionally be the bottom side, the holes are countersunk. Okay. And so I'm going to do it with the, 
the diamond side sticking up. So basically like the cylinder is wearing the diamond as a hat. So mm -hmm. I'm going to have the diamond sticking up and I'm going to use my big key seat cutter that I use for the salami slice method. And I'm mm -hmm. going to undercut it and do a, um, a probably a bore operation to finish the underside of that part with the slitting saw. And then I can oh, do it all cool. in one op. That'll be really cool. Are you backside chamfering? I will probably do that, at least on the top of the diamond. I don't think I'll be able to hit the bottom of the cylinder with the backside chamfer, but that would be easy enough to do by hand. And, the, and there's a hole going through the center of the cylinder. That's easy enough to do with a countersink by hand. You should get a key seat cutter with a 45 degree. I should chamfer because then you could you could backside chamfer and salami slice. You just do a you do a thin cut that adds the chamfer and then you go down and slice it off with the same cutter. Yep. Though now that I've been talking about this and I've been excited about it, I'm re I'm realizing that it actually might be slow to do the um the roughing underneath the diamond with the key seat cutter. Because well, there's be just slow. a lot of material to remove there. I tested a very similar part, except I didn't have the underhang, where I finished it using the key seat cutter the other day, and it worked really well. But I think it might be too slow. Hmm. So never mind. I may not do this the fun way, now that I think about it. We'll talk about it next week. Yeah. <laughs> the thing you... I was excited for may not be exciting. <laughs> I would cam it out both ways and just see what your time yeah. looks like. Worst case scenario, I do most of it as a one op and I just do the counter sinks in the second op. Yeah, that wouldn't be too bad. It'd be easier so, to champ for two. I don't know. I need to make a hundred of them. They're due in like three days, but it's all Delrin. Material will be here oh. tomorrow. The cycle time on these things is like, well, according to toolpath.com, the cycle time on these things is like... This, 50 seconds not using oh. the key seat method that's with two ops yeah that's good that won't be too bad are you going to do them in a row part. so if i do the salami slice method i can't because i only have one fixture that i can hold them in if i do two ops i'll do both ops in the flux vice man i am probably gonna have to do it that way Okay, never mind. No fun method. We'll save that one for later. I'll do it as okay. two ops in the flux vice. Op, like both in soft jaws, but the first one will just be from cylindric stock, and then the second one will be from... Oh, I, I got round stock already. I already ordered it. Oh, okay, okay. That makes sense. Yeah, I'll have to do op one as just coming out of the cylinder in the first op in the flux vice, and then flip it over and just do those countersinks as the second op. That'll work. Anything else going on? So while I was waiting for tools to show up today, I spent a long time working on getting all of my speeds and feeds built into my tool library. Like I went through mm -hmm. all of my core tools and I've recently kind of revamped my core tools anyway. So they were kind of missing a lot of information, but now every single one of my core tools has speeds and feeds for every type of operation I do and every type of material that I do. So they all have, um, it's like floor finishing, wall finishing, roughing, slotting, and boring at a minimum in stainless, low carbon steel, titanium, copper, aluminum, brass, plastic. Gotcha. So I, I spent a long time doing that, but now it's been super nice where... Like the toolpath.com, they link to your fusion library and use your actual speeds and feeds. Mm -hmm. And so now that I have all of those mapped out, I can get an actual time estimate from my actual tools. And it seems to yeah. be pretty close from what I've been playing with so far. And I went through and I added the cost of all the different materials. They do it by cubic inch, which was a little bit hard to calculate. I ended up just using make master prices. Um, and I don't know, they might be a little bit high, but whatever. And so now it automatically like generates quotes for me. Yeah, I need to I need to spend the time to go do that. We've been we've been kind of 
Frankensteining our tool library between the mm-hmm. Tormach and the Haas. And I need to go through and kill a whole bunch of tools that we're probably never going to use again and kind of trim the fat and then go through and do all my feeds and speeds and different materials and whatnot. And it's, it's something that's been on the list for a long time. We just haven't had time to do it. We're kind of getting to the point where we're getting ahead on a few things. So I might actually have some time. So I might, might be something that will be coming up here soon. Yep. Or do like one tool a day or something. Yeah. I got faster as I went. The first one I did was like very slow. I It took me like half an hour or 45 minutes to do one tool because mm-hmm. I was using the Harvey speeds and feeds for my tool. And I don't know, it was just a lot of clicking and typing and transferring. But as I went, I realized that like Harvey kind of had like just use some formulas and it's mm-hmm. like for roughing, they use a 25% step over. And I don't know. There were a couple things like that. And you can use formulas in the fusion speeds and feeds window. So mm-hmm. instead of typing in the different step over every single time, I changed it. So it'd be just like, you know, 25% times diameter. And then I never had to fill it out again. But once, and, once you have a tool set up, though, it doesn't. Like, it's not like you can change that to a standard and then retroactively apply it, can you? What do you mean? So, like, if I had, let's say, a tool that I've been using for a long time, and then I wanted to go back in and add another tool path to it, would that go ahead and pull the new default, you know, let's say 25% step over and whatnot equation? Or would that, because that tool has already been in use, it only shows up when I create a new tool from scratch. Then it pulls in all that equation and all that stuff. Okay. So this stuff is fun and how fusion handles it. And by fun, I mean, it's a mess. So when you, as soon as you use a tool inside a program, fusion creates a copy of that tool. It pulls it from the cloud library in its current state. It creates a copy of it and it sticks it in your document. If you like, right click on the tool path and hit edit. And then you change that tool uh, that stays local to the document. It does not push back up to the cloud. If you change something in the cloud, it does not push back down into your document. What you have to do is open up your tool path and like hit change tool, go find the tool in your cloud library. And then when you select it, it'll pull down all the new stuff. Mm-hmm. So changing the tools does not mess up your, um, speeds and feeds in existing documents. I'm, I'm not talking about existing documents. I'm talking about speeds and feeds. Like you said, you're creating all these different tool paths and you're using equations. Does it, I'm, are you updating things? Cause you can do step over and SFM and feed per tooth and all of that stuff. I'm talking about like the actual settings of the tool themselves. When you're editing the tool library, are you editing those equations to have those yes. values? Yes, they are in they are with the tool in the like the tool feeds and speeds presets. Okay. So when you're doing that and you have a tool that's pre existing, does it pull in like let's say I have a tool that's it's I've used it forever and I create a new feeds and speed um setting. Let's preset. say I had a, aluminum roughing and I want to add in or let's say I have stainless roughing and I want to add in a steel roughing. When I go to create that new preset is it going to go ahead and and grab the step down and step over this 25 like if i set that as an equation is it going to remember that even though though that tool was pre-existing okay so basically the way i do it is okay so there's two different things you can do one if you've set that up for one tool path let's say you have it for stainless roughing and you want to do mild steel roughing you can just copy the stainless roughing and then change like the sfm Mm-hmm. and everything else will update. Alternatively, and this is what I what I was doing, is I built one tool out that had all 30 or whatever of my uh, presets, and then I would just duplicate that tool and then change the diameter and the flute length, and okay. it would be able to okay. calculate most of the other stuff. Okay, that's what I was basically getting at. So you were creating a new tool every single time. Um, you just had a, a starter tool that you you created yeah. all those that stuff in. Okay, that's what I was wondering. And for the most part, like once I got rolling, I pretty much just had to change 
the feed per tooth because the step over the step down that stuff is basically just dependent on the size of the tool the surface feed is pretty much just dependent on the material and the that just leaves chip load which i could not nail down a um equation for so they must have data on that or something or more variables than are immediately obvious Mm -hmm. fair enough i've i've always loved the harvey speeds and feeds calculator it is (laughs) it is the best in the industry at least that i've found so far i'm not even using harvey tools i'm using sgs yeah well i mean for the core five that i was using i went to the harvey to get speeds and feeds because Kenna Metal's got that Novo thing to calculate speeds and feeds, which looks great, but it's just a bunch of sliders and it's like telling you the raw data, but it's not, and it's got like preferred points, but it's like, is that a preferred point for adaptive? Is that a preferred point yeah. for finishing? Is that a preferred point for slotting? Like, like it, it, there's no drop down menu to change your mode that you're using the tool in. And it's, it's hard enough to select material, let alone select mode. And so it's like, okay, you're telling me what the range that you expect that tool to to like operate in, but that doesn't tell me like any starting parameters for different cutting modes. And it's it's really annoying. And so anyways, yeah, you're not, not a fan. I like Harvey's where you can say I'm doing finishing adaptive, traditional roughing, all that fun stuff. Mine never shows me adaptive tool paths. Do you know why? Because you mentioned that the other day, and I went, like went back and made sure it didn't show me adaptive toolpaths. It they only shows it me toolpaths for traditional roughing. They don't call it that. They call it try pull one up real quick. High efficiency milling, something like that. Those are the only other synonyms I can think of. I'm gonna look up the one that I was just looking at today. All right, I got it. I'm getting all my information for my machine put in. And so, yeah, they call it high efficiency milling. Yeah. So I got full slot, traditional roughing, finishing, helical plunge, high efficiency milling, and trachoidal slotting. Why do you have so many more options than I do? I wonder if it's the tools. Are you using Harvey or helical? I'm using the Harvey one. I'm using helical interesting it's still the same machine advisory pro yeah same machine advisory pro uh stuff but it's the helical website is what i go through that's interesting i wonder i wonder if i pulled up a similar tool inside that one if i can find it though i know helical does not have a lot of the tools that i use and that could be I could look up a Harvey one real quick. Because do I... they go below a quarter inch? That's a good question. I... Man, it's not even, we're not even 20 minutes in. Well, we are 20 minutes in. We're not even half an hour in, and we're already doing shopping on a podcast. Yeah. They go to an eighth inch on, really? on, oh, the, okay. on the five flutes for aluminum. Let me see what the three flute for aluminum does, just for fun. Just for fun. For I had for some reason just already dismissed helical completely, and because I thought they didn't carry the sizes of tools that I needed, but those are I eighth could... inch. I think eighth inch is the smallest that they go. Just looking through a couple different things, yeah. Everything I'm pulling up, eighth inch is the smallest they go. Interesting. Okay. So, but for like for like bigger cutters, uh, like well, bigger cutters, anything over an eighth, eighth inch, inch is a you say eighth inch is like my rougher <laughs> yeah yeah everything i'm seeing that i can pull up on on helical is eighth inch is the smallest i can find but that that seems to be like i use helical speeds and speeds i call it harvey but it's it's just because they're all using the same stinking calculator it just apparently harvey has or helical has more options apparently helical yeah they have like it's almost too many options uh, they'll have like 37 different options of like a three eighths inch flat and mill for aluminum. Yeah, but I, I kind of like that. I don't know. It's it's been nice that like what I've been able to find and it's it's 
it runs so good whenever I, I've only had, I think one tool path that I've gotten from them. And I think it was more of a limitation of the Tormach than, mm -hmm. um, because I think that was one I ran on the Tormach than anything. Do you know how Helix Angle affects I wish. the cut? I wish I knew better. I don't. Okay. That was something that I was thinking about trying to test for the cheeky tools. Mm -hmm. I think they need to be a higher Helix. And I'm hoping that will make them less... Um, because it's a single flute. So they're kind of like bang, 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 bang as they go around. And I was hoping with a higher helix angle, you might be able to get a swish, 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 swish. Yeah. But I honestly don't understand the purpose of having steeper or less deeper flutes. Yeah. I feel like. Mm hmm. And which would do better on a machine, like a lightweight machine, like a um, Shape Oko or CNC router, the kind of thing those cheeky tools are designed for. Yeah. If I remember correctly, the higher helix helps with traditional roughing and high efficiency milling tool paths. And then the lower helix, I think, is better for finishing. I think I don't remember. I think this is something we need to do more research on. Yeah, it is for sure. Cause that's definitely something I always, I always go for like the middle of the road, which is I think 40 degrees. There's like 30, 40, 40 and 45. Those are like the common yeah. helix angles. And then there's also variable pitch, which I'd be curious how big of a difference that makes. I got a fun end mill in the mail the other day. What's that? It was like when I stuck in my cart on MSC, it was like a, I don't remember what it was, like a 16th inch flat end mill or something like that. Mm -hmm. And it, it had no flutes when it got to me. It is just oh, the really? core. It is, it is flutless. It's oh. a, it's a, de a defect. Yeah. But it has like, it's, it's funny because it has the, like the teeth on the end, but there's no flutes. Mm. Yeah. Have you ordered a lot of probe tips by chance? I I mean, no. The answer is no. I've ordered a couple for my Tormach probe. I need a backup for my Renishaw. It, I've ordered probes tips from a couple different companies, and it seems like every single company I've ever ordered probe tips from, if I order like a batch of three at a time, one of them is outside the box and rattling around in the shipping. That's oh. happened to me from like three different suppliers at this point. And they all come in the same type of box that has like foam that's supposed to keep them from rattling mm -hmm. around. And it's like that foam opens the box and shipping. And mm. then it's like out going all over the place. Thankfully, I've never broken a probe tip or found one that was broken after shipping like that. But it's happened from like three different suppliers at this point. Where do you get your probe tips? Because I was looking for them and I was just looking on McMaster. But it was expensive. It was like 80 bucks or something or 100 bucks. So I've gotten them from Haas. I've gotten them from Tormach. And then I've gotten them from a couple other generic places online. I don't remember okay. the other ones. But I've gotten them from like three or four different suppliers and tried different ones. Um, the one I would like to try that I haven't ordered some from yet is... Uh, Q Mark, I think is the name. Okay, of the I recognize that name. I think from the business of machine machining. Yeah, they do probe tips. I, I... I want to. Oh, go on. I... I I would like to get a smaller one. I think a three to four millimeter uh, probe tip ball is about the perfect size for the type of work we do, and I'd like maybe a little bit longer of a probe extension from ours i think those two things would make it a little i mean honestly it hasn't been that bad we haven't been machining a whole lot of small parts on the new machine mm -hmm. um but when it comes up um that's the six millimeter ball is just a little bit too big to measure off some features that we we commonly do 
Yeah, I think I'm going to go to a two millimeter. Because basically that'll let me get in an eighth inch hole is kind of what I was thinking. Mm -hmm. Or probe something that's only an eighth inch thick, which is something I've had come up before. Though I do like the bigger ball and like the bigger, um, well, yeah, the bigger ball for helping avoid any burrs. I scrapped a part the other day because I believe the stem, like it was an op two part and I um, came and I removed the hat and then probed for the sides and then kept doing the machining. And I believe what happened is the there was a little bit of a mismatch and something, and I ended up with a little bit of the hat sticking out the side. So and, I have a solution for that. Okay. So anytime I'm doing op two probing for like I'm taking the hat off and I'm removing it, I'm trying mm-hmm. to get in the habit of setting my tolerance, my sizing tolerance to be like three or four thou. That way if something if it does catch a burr and it is larger. It'll it'll air out the machine and say, hey, this thing's oversized. And then I can look at it and go, oh, you just measured a burr. Let me stop and clean that real quick. And then you can get back to work. That's a good idea. I don't remember how I was locating. Yeah. I, yeah, I don't remember how I was locating it um, before the probing. I was probably being pretty lazy and quick and dirty about it. But yeah. But I have found that that method is the most reliable because even though I want to build up processes that could be robot ready at some point, that's the goal we've been working towards a lot here recently, which is just make everything super reliable, basically, yeah. and as hands off as possible. I want things to error out if there is a problem. And that is one of the processes that I've recently figured out is just if there, if I am probing to locate a part um, and I'm trying to probe off of a machine size, I need to have a tolerance in there. That's low that says, Hey, if you're outside that range, there's a problem. It could be that the part is scrap because it's out of size, which would be one reason to not waste time machining it. The other thing could be that there's a burr or something else. Um, Regardless, it needs to stop if that happens. That is a good idea. I have been, I have started working on kind of increasing my process reliability because really like the number one thing that slows me down is breaking tools and scrapping parts. Like I do that more than I should. And so obviously that's bad and I want to avoid that. And that was one of the reasons I went through and like really nailed down speeds and feeds for like every tool I do and every material I do. Because I, for example, I would not have broken that end mill that sent me back like two or three days if I had good speeds and feeds. But I think it was probably the first time that I had been slotting in brass. And I think I got a little cavalier about depth of cut and it broke the tool. And that was my last one. And then I got stuck. So the other thing I am starting to work on doing is so I have templates set up and they right now my templates are kind of based around the setups. It's like, you know, I have my four jaw Chuck template. I have my ER call it template. I have my mod vice template. I have my flux vice template. Well, the flux vice is in all my other templates, but I had, you know, basically they're all based around the, uh, the work holding. And I think what I need to do is change it to be around the style of part. So I had a list somewhere, but, you know, for example, I have the um, what I'm calling a lathe style part. And uh, then there's like um, like plate parts and block with holes. And I don't know, basically just all the kind of styles of parts that I make on a regular basis. And I can kind of build more of a proven process into those templates other than just like going off the work holding Um, or a salami slice part. That's another good one. And I think what I'm going to focus on for the next, I don't know, few months here at most is really developing those templates and getting those set up to like, I can just drop a part and hit go and have a, um, you know, get a good part off of it and just, like, so I'm going to try to take, like, you know, if I, I'm, I've been working on, um, like the lathe style parts and 
I have taken a couple parts off of Zometry that I would not normally take, but they're like helping me prove out some of these processes. Gotcha. That's good. Yeah. I got a lot of stuff to work on too. I just need time. Our shop's coming together more and more. That's good. So, so physically, they, literally, <laughs> physically <laughs> with new literally. walls, <laughs> new walls. Yeah. They just got done putting up sheet metal. We replaced all the sheet metal around the outside of the building. So we were looking at getting it painted or replacing the sheet metal. And it came out to where it was really close to the same cost. Like it was, yeah. it was like 20% more to get new metal versus painting it. And I'm so glad we did that because we found a lot of rot underneath those old panels. And actually, I think in all four corners and around the garage door, we ended up replacing a significant amount of wood because mm-hmm. the building was old and just the metal had like holes in it and it was, it was just nasty and bad. So I'm really glad it looks a lot better and it's a lot more structurally sound. So um happy about that. And then AC was supposed to be installed, has yet to be installed. Oh, no. So it was all wired for electricity today. So it was supposed to be installed and it was supposed to get wired for electricity today. The electricity has been run and it's ready, but none of the AC has been installed. So uh, two different contractors or the same person? Yes, two different contractors. Okay. So was that the cause of the delay? A little bit. So we did get a big ceiling fan put up though. Um, we were kind of trying to figure out if we wanted to do that and, AC, the guy was supposed to be in here like two or three weeks ago, and he's just really slow and just keeps putting us off and putting us off and putting us off. And last week it got up to like 85 degrees Oof. or 90 degrees in the shop, somewhere in there, about like the highest I got last week. And it was just like, okay, we've got to have something. Like we're dying and it's only going to get worse. And yep. so we got a 10 foot fan. It was, we were looking at those uh, <clears throat> big ass fans, but mm-hmm. we couldn't afford one of those. So we got like a residential giant fan and it's the same one. I think that what Weston got one of the same brand. I think it was a little bit smaller, but the same brand at his house and he really liked it. And so he found their largest one they offered. It was a couple hundred bucks. So it wasn't too, it wasn't terrible. And uh, we put that in. And it's made a huge difference just for the airflow in the shop and nice. making it more bearable throughout the day. Yep. That AC will be huge though. Once you get that. Yeah. Yeah. That'll be, that'll be really nice. And so anyways, it's just exciting to see the shop getting coming together more and more. And I feel like, I feel like every week is stressful But every week we get, you know, a little bit more efficient and a little bit more efficient. And, you know, it feels like we're getting a little bit closer to that point we were at in the old shop where it seemed like everything was about as efficient as we could get it with the setup we had Mm -hmm. without making major expenses. So. Or major investments, I should say. Um, And I mean, don't get me wrong. We're making major investments right now. Like we're spending money faster than we're making it, but it feels like it's we're getting work done faster, even though we're not machining as much as we should be because of everything else that's going on. Um, it's, it still feels like everything's progressing faster and faster. So the, um, profit first system has been working well for me for the last, I don't know, a couple of weeks, however long ago I started it. It's going to take a little while for it to kind of even out and start, you know, flowing, but yeah. I think it'll be good for you as, as that kind of comes in. Yeah. Is, is there any, any like immediate, like, Oh my goodness, I didn't realize that moments. So it highlighted that I was spending a lot more on, I don't know what the term form is like mild or small capital investments than I thought. So things like tool holders and, um, I guess you could argue a call. It's a consumable, but tool holders and call it's and, like some metrology stuff and like fixtures. Like I was spending a lot more stuff on that than I, or a lot more money on that than I thought I was. And, Mm -hmm. um, 
now with the way I have my my budget set up, I've actually overcompensated and I'm not putting enough in that folder. Mm-hmm. And I have too much in OPEX. So I'm getting a surplus in operation expenses and I can move, you know, I can reallocate some points here at some point. But yeah, um, that was that was kind of the, the biggest, most interesting thing. Yeah, which makes sense. And as as time goes on, like I said, you'll become you'll you'll mess with those numbers less and less. And I would recommend only messing with them once every three to six months and then eventually maybe a, once a year or twice a year. Yeah. I don't remember his name. Oh, Mike McCowitz. Mike McCowitz recommends adjusting them quarterly and not doing it more than by three percent at a time. I will probably follow that in the future. I may take a rain check here or not a rain check, but take a, I don't know, a mulligan on my original numbers and adjust them oh, now that oh, I yeah. have a little bit better info. Oh, you have to, because you got to start out with numbers that you think work and then you got to just kind of play with them. And it's, it's just takes a while to figure out what, what needs to be where. So that's totally understandable. The, <laughs> I have had one minor problem with it though. What's that? I, I'm having a really hard time getting the money out of this bank and putting it into my, like I'm having a hard time paying myself. I haven't paid myself in two weeks because we're trying to get the, um, you know, it's a fairly new account with a new bank. And the way it was originally set up was apparently wrong, which was part of my problem where the, I have the, um, I call it payroll. He calls it something else like owner's compensation. Mm -hmm. That, was supposed to be set up as a checking account, but they set it up as this like variant of a savings account that they have. And the variant of a savings account that they have, you can't move money out of it other than transferring it to a your checking account. Mm-hmm. And I didn't want to be like transferring money back into my OPEX account to give myself a check, you know, every time I take a check. Yeah. Um, so I had to go back into the bank and open a new checking account. And now I'm trying to get the new checking account linked to my old checking account. And I tried to set up the online login so that I can do that. But I think because I used the same email, it freaked out. And now that do you ha- do you have to do it all? Exist. Do you have to do it all under different logins for all the different accounts? So it's weird. I went to the small little local bank and some of their website stuff is not the best. Okay. The short answer is no for the most part. The you set up like an account and they have like these I don't know. I set up an account. I set up a checking account and you get a checking account and a savings account by default. And then they have these other accounts. They called them like club accounts or something like that. It's basically a savings account. It's a little bit higher interest than like a regular savings account but nothing wild. The caveat is you can you can put you can transfer money in, you can transfer money out and that's all you can do. It's basically just a folder for money, which is actually very nice and kind of what I want. I wish USAA would do something like that. And then Okay, so then I had to sec- set up a second checking account. That second checking account shows up with my normal account just like it would in any other bank. Like I can see it from my same online login. But the way they do bill pay is weird. They use like a third party bill pay vendor that does like the the ACH transfers and stuff. And with that vendor, you have to it ha- you have to log in and set up bill pay on a different account. Okay. But I have somehow ruined everything there and I'll probably have to call my bank and have them like reset it. So Interesting. It's yeah, I don't know. It's mostly just computer shenanigans at this point that I have to get figured out, but well, you'll get it there. Yeah. And once I get it set up once, like, you know, it'll just auto pay me. Um I I've, I've can, had Can you set it up to do as a percentage? Time. Or are you do, you're doing it as a straight up cash amount? Yeah, a straight up cash amount. Okay. That was one of the whole one of the goals of switching to this system and moving to the separate bank mm-hmm. account is I want the uh, like it particularly for my wife and being able to budget stuff just the same amount every week. If I want to give yep. myself a raise later, I can give myself a raise later. Yep. 
and you can play with your percentages and see if you're growing and whatnot. Yeah. And the nice thing about that is hopefully that account is growing over time. And eventually once you've got, you know, maybe one or two months worth, you can just automatically know that you can increase it a little bit. Yeah. So I forgot. I did get something else done. What's that? Um, this was something we had talked about. I think last week I got a lot of like my infrastructure put together for being able to do sales. I designed business cards. I ordered business cards. I um, put together just a really quick and dirty website and threw that up. Actually, I wonder if that's live yet. Last time I checked, it wasn't live. But like basically those two things are just the bare minimum I need to be able to start talking to local businesses. Mm-hmm. And I mean, it's it's good enough. It's not great. It's good enough. And then if you know, I can invest more time back in it as I get time. We're going to be gone all Thursday this week. I forgot about that. Wow. What you doing? So Ken and metal is doing like a, a Ken and metal tour across the U S mm-hmm. and they're going to, one of our local sales reps, uh, got us tickets for it. And so we're going to be going to it. Cool. So they have a lot of door prizes and whatnot. I forget what they called it, but it's, it's like a Ken and metal road tour or something. And so it'll be a lot of fun. Go, go rub elbows and try to meet more people in the industry. Um, I, it seems like I, like I'm, I'm trying to go to more and more big events like that and meet people around. And it seems, <laughs> it doesn't seem like much has come of it yet, but our name is getting out more and more, more and more people are finding us and hearing about us. We picked up a new customer today. A local place and they're actually interested in our tour mock so oh really <laughs> they came by this afternoon to kind of meet us and i was kind of giving them the kind of the nickel tour of the shop and i mentioned i said yeah that's our old machine they're trying to sell it and they're like oh really and i was like yeah and they're like well we might be interested they're like it's a single phase machine i was like yeah it's like okay well i gave them all the uh the pros and cons of the tour mock and just like you know hey this is not a a big boy um uh, vmc that you can find in like for every other place but if you're doing one-off prototype work uh r&d type work it's great it's a perfect machine for that kind of stuff i have to say i've actually been missing my tormach like just having the second spindle around and mm-hmm. something with a little bit bigger of a taper for doing longer tools i'm yep. kind of missing that I'm yep. still glad I did what I did, yeah. um, but I wouldn't mind it back. <laughs> well, you just you just need, like you said, like a like a mini mill or a TM machine yeah. or, you know, something like that. And I think that'll that'll make a big difference. We've been looking at the used machine market and they had the perfect machine. It, I I really wanted to get it oh so bad, um, but we just didn't have the Tormach sold yet, and we weren't in a position where we could bite the bullet yet. But I'll tell you a little bit about this machine. It was a it was a Haas uh, VF2 SSYT 15k spindle 2021 50 plus tools, auto doors, Wi-Fi camera, high speed machining. Basically, it was about as every single option that you could add mm-hmm. to a machine. Uh, I think I added it all up and it was about 145, uh, 142, 145,000 in total options. And they wanted like 80 grand for it. And it was, it was 2021. And I think it had, I'm going to see if I can find the original offer, but I, I think it had like less than 2000 hours on it. And it was just like, Oh, I want this so bad. Fourth axis drive. The only thing it didn't have that we want, it was an actual fourth axis. Mm, yeah. Cause we, our next machine is going to have to have a fourth axis. So someone sent me a listing for a, uh, OM two that had a fourth axis and it was like 20,000, I think. Uh, a little bit newer than mine. I think it was 2008. I was like, mm, that's kind of tempting. Yeah. I have been looking for a used fourth axis and I cannot find one. Like they, 
a, a used HRT 110 or 100. Mm-hmm. They just, I, I can't find any. They don't exist. And someone else, someone in the, the Haas OM slash CM operators group posted like, hey, does anybody know where I can find one of these? And there were like four other people that were like, I'm trying to find one too. So apparently they yeah. are in high demand. Oh, let's see. But here. I'm not buying a machine. Not buying a machine. <laughs> I keep telling myself that. Not buying a machine. I want a machine, but I'm not buying a machine. Yeah. Not we until are the end buying of this a machine at some point. Um, it's going to happen because the Tormox got to go. And I need a replacement for it. Um, it's a lot sooner than I was planning, though. Speaking of which, hey, Tormok, you guys want to give me a 1500M? We'll get you like half a dozen listens on a podcast. It'll be there great advertising. I did a video on that machine. I haven't pu- published it yet. I'll probably do that tonight or tomorrow morning. It's an impressive machine. I I want one. It's an Again, I'd probably be better off spending the same amount of money on like a used TM2P or a Super Mini Mill or something, but... No, it's. It, I was on their website and it popped up with a little survey. You know, what do you think? What are your impressions or something like that? And, and basically, what I said was, I really wish you guys had this machine like two, three years ago. Yeah. <laughs> like, I, I think they nailed it. I think it's the perfect balance between, like, it's it's an American company with U.S. support and. You know, like Haas, basically. It has all the the pros of it, it being Haas, except maybe the Haas controller that, you know, operators may be used to. But also, it's easier to get in and out of a garage. It's mm-hmm. uh, single phase. Like, you can move it with a pallet jack. Yeah. It, I don't know. I think they nailed it. I think they're going to sell a lot of these. I, I think the biggest pro that they have for that machine is the fact that you can get it with through spindle coolant, a wireless probe, and um a chip conveyor at some point Mm -hmm. and like those are big boy features the a machine of that price point to get those options on a entry-level machine like a uh a mini mill uh you know a tm or what what have you a dc1 a dc1 like you're going to be spending a lot more to get all the options that that one comes with or can get up to uh, for a lot less. And so yeah. um, I and I think it's going to be very popular. It was almost exactly the same price as the style that I optioned out whenever that was like last year. So which I think is very intentional. Yeah. I would be willing to bet it's got slightly less performance than the style. Oh, yeah. However, I also would have had to buy a, a rotary phase converter with the style. Yeah, the style would be more horsepower. It, it's going to need a phase converter. Does it have through spindle coolant as an option that you can even get for those? I don't know. I don't know. Because I think I think that's going to be one of the standout features that most of the machines are not... Because I don't think you can get through spindle coolant on a mini mill or on a TM machine. Mm. I think you can on a mini mill. I'm not sure about a TM. Okay. I don't remember about the DC one. That's what I compared it to in the video. The DC one with like basically the bare minimum that makes sense. It came out to 50 K. Yeah. And the Tormach with everything that made sense came out to 45 K. Yeah. But that's and again, still the probably style. Decent. The one I'd that I a... go ahead. Sorry. Go sorry. on. I was just going to say, if, if there's only a 5K difference, I'd probably go with the Haas over the Tormach at that point. Really? I think so. I don't know. I would go with the I would go with the new mini mill before I went with the DC1. Yeah. The, let's see. Oh, I was going to say. Oh, so the style, like I said, the one I had optioned out was like 45K. Maybe that did include the rotary face converter. I think that did include the face converter. And it was a fairly well-optioned one. So I think you could... Get more machine for cheaper with the style, but you'll have to deal with the um, the Chinese support and service and the risks to your supply chain. 
Yeah. So. Yeah. I It'll think, be interesting. I think the Tormach makes really, like, with a couple exceptions. Like, if you happen to have a big shop already, then yeah, go for a Haas. But I think the Tormach makes a lot of sense. It is definitely one of the top end garage shop machines. And I, yeah. I'll be curious how that spindle lasts. Because that would be the <laughs> other area that would, like, make me. We. Tormach spindles might have a bad reputation on this podcast. Yeah. But yeah. Bravo, Tormach. You did good on this one. Yeah. Assuming, I don't know, I guess there's none of these out in the wild. You have a chance to screw it up still, but. Yeah. It Just seems like the, you did good, kid. From the um, the report card, <laughs> it looks <Yeah>. good. <laughs> so. Um, speaking of report cards, I think we should thank our Patreons. This podcast has a Patreon, patreon.com slash taps and patience. We have a new Patreon, which is Zach from Volunteer Machine Works. Thank you, Zach. And then our 10 buck a month um, characters. I almost call them characters. Sure. I'm sure they're characters. Our 10 buck a month characters. We have Chris from Z- Zagic Precision. Uh, EJ at Nocturnal Welming. S- well, D- e- I did pretty well on the intro, but <laughs> I'm screwing up words now. EJ at Nocturnal Welding. Simon. We have Chris at Thought Bomb Design, and as ever, Jake Brownson, who has been around for a very long time. If you'd like to become a patron, you get early access to all of the Taps and Patience episodes, except for the one from last week, and access to all the uh, Audacity micro videos a little bit early. Also, we are working on a coin, which we have artwork for. I don't have the finished design. That should be in my email any day now. Okay. That's that's good. So that coin will go out. Did we did we say May 15th or something? I, I don't know if we ever set a date. I'm going to have to re-listen to the last episode. Because I think we did. I think we said like mid-May. If you have joined the Patreon before mid-May, you will get that. If you are a current Patreon, you will get that coin. Uh, if you sign up between now and mid-May, you'll get that coin. So... It's going to be awesome. Harrison's going to make them. Uh, I'm having Adam C, who is a graphic designer that has done some really awesome illustrations for me before. Not AI generated. Actually supported an artist on this one. You you can get that coin by signing up for the Patreon. So it'll be can I, can I, about a month. Yeah. Can I probe oh. you a little bit about the design? Sure. Okay. For my own curiosity's sake, is each Patreon going to have their name in the coin? Or something no. well, like is going to be know. unique. Are or you, you're the one doing the laser work. Is this something you want to do? <laughs> it's real easy to put like someone's name on it if they're if it's just text. That's not a big deal. I have no issue with that. We just got to make sure that the, the the right coin goes in the right package. Yeah, like the label. But other than that, it's not that bad. Sure, you heard it here first. Harrison's promising that everybody gets their own unique coin. It's 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 an art some artwork of revolving around our uh, founding story, and it says something along the lines of um, taps and patience, Patreon founding member, something like that. Okay. Oh yeah, that'd be good to have their name on it, sure. or whatever they want on it. Yeah, yeah, I like doing that. I, I like making things unique. Uh, I mean, the, the laser, all that is, is just typing in different text. Uh, yep. I just need to know the font that they're using in the design. We'll need to figure out where to fit it in. But I guess, I wonder if he's done with the design yet. Because if he's not, I can ask him to leave a blank. Yeah. Because if we can put their name somewhere on it, I'd, I'd like to do that. So, make it personal. Yep. So... If you have a small business and you'd like a shout out, shoot us a message. If you have questions, leave them in the Patreon Discord. If you need parts made, if they're bigger than a cubic inch, send them to Harrison. If they're smaller than a cubic inch, send them to me. Mm -hmm. And that's our music. Working hard in a little machine shop. Tapping threads and turning metals nonstop. This is a hard intro to like actually talk over it do, it's true it does have words yeah we'll ace this race greasy hands
sense of sparks flying high. Machines <laughs> small shop, big if things are going well, they hum well. <laughs> I haven't actually listened to it this far before. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> Wait, did it restart or is this just the next verse? I'm not sure. I don't know how to tell on my soundboard. Oh. I thought it was done. <laughs> this sounds different. Yeah, it's a little bigger. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> We're going to have to do like this same thing, just with different prompts. Like, like, uh, this is what, 80s music or 90s music? Yes. We got two notes there at the end. Oh yeah, that was weird. Have you ever watched Code Bullet? Uh yes, not not a YouTube channel to watch with kids around, by the way. But in yeah. his last video, he had like very very specific um like montage music that was probably AI. Well, it's got to be AI, and I kind of want to do that on my YouTube videos, but I, yeah, I don't think it's worth the effort. <laughs> that that would be fun if it's if it's not too hard. That would be fun. So. Anyways, for those of you who've been hanging out with us, the whole we point of this was the outro. The whole song. Yeah. It's the first time we played the whole song. It was interesting for all parties involved. Except Even the our people listeners. who listen to us at double speed. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm sure that was that was fun. All right, guys. Thanks for hanging out with us. This has been Harrison with Precision Ingenuity signing out with AJ from Audacity Micro. Thanks for hanging out and make sure you like, subscribe, and tell all your friends. Oh, by the way, I have six different versions of the song. Oh my goodness. The the one I played was the best one with better lyrics. Is this the bloopers reel now? I told you this one wasn't as good. It hasn't like even talked about machining yet. No, <laughs> no, but it's just like eighties lyrics in the middle of the night or something like that. That's that is like people are not going to take that as machining. <laughs> very unique. Okay, I'm done now. <laughs>